So we're going to talk about courage and weakness. I don't know if you can all see this uh, thing. Those, uh, those dogs look like they're going to just give that little kitten a kiss, I think, right? That's, that's what they're thinking about right now. Um, and so some days, sometimes, some avenues of life, we feel like we're that kitten, right? At times where just nothing's quite going your way. Things are not what you planned. Things are not how you thought it was going to be. And it feels like the kind of deck is stacked against you. So we're going we're gonna to walk through a couple of those. And I'm hoping that some of you, maybe all of you, can relate um, to this. I know as God laid this on my heart and I was preparing this, I just floods of memories of uh, youth and uh, being a kid and then all the way up to present time, I can start relating to these things. Let's go to the next slide. So have you ever felt that you're not worthy? And I don't know how that manifests itself in your life, but you know, the feeling that you're inadequate or that you're not measuring up or you're not fitting in, um, those leave a powerful impression on our lives whether it's getting picked for the kickball team and you're the last one standing there and they begrudgingly say, okay, you can, you can come on our team, right? Or middle school and you're trying to find which table you're supposed to sit at and you're not sure and you're getting weird looks from everybody and suddenly you're sitting at your own table. And just the feelings that are, that are up, uh, with that, let's click a couple of these. How about relationships? How about that first broken heart that you had where you just thought this was the best thing that ever happened to you and you were dancing down the halls and then one day it came crashing down and your heart was broken in half and you thought I could never go on. Those left a little, each of these leave a little like shields over our heart where we say to ourselves, whether we say it or not, I'm going to protect myself against this going forward. How about physically, right? How about, I don't, I don't know about you, but I matured late in life. So for a long time, middle school, high school, those years, I was the little scrawny kid who wasn't anything. In high school, everybody was shaving, and I didn't even know how to shave. I didn't even know if I was ever going to shave. Um, and so it was just a, this is a weird you know, time in my life. Um, academics, I know I, I jumped into college and um, I remember, you know, hanging out with some of my new friends there and we're sitting through a class and we're getting ready to study for a test and these guys seemed to know everything about what we were about to study. I'd sat at every class they sat at and yet I couldn't remember anything and these math equations just seemed to not kind of come to me as easy as it came to everybody else, and it just seemed kind of unfair that everybody else seemed to be so much smarter than I was, and I had to work so much harder just to kind of barely keep up with them. Why? Why was this? Why, why am I in this situation? Athletics, I think we've all been there, right? Even, even when you're good at something, and you've prepared and trained and trained and trained, and you poured all your life into something, and then you lose, right? You think about we, my my kids like uh, St Steph Curry, right? He's maybe one of the best basketball players out there right now. And we were debating about what the field percentage of him hitting three-point shot. He's known for hitting three-point shots. And we, we were going back and forth. How, how much percentage does he make it or not make it? And the answer was, this is maybe the best three-point shooter of all time. He makes it 43%. So roughly 60% of the time, that guy misses. Man, he goes up, and two out of three, doink, and misses, right? So he's dealing with taking chances and losing all the time, and he's the best. We're celebrating him. He's posters on the wall and a household name for being good less than half the time. So how about our connection with others, right? From relationships to fitting in, fitting in at work, fitting in with your family, fitting in with basically anyone, good friends, come and go. How do we make those connections? Are we worthy? Do we feel worthy? 
that is always in question. And our whole life has been a series of going through these stumbles and skinning our knee and having issues or having bad things happen to us, if we call that, in, in these areas and maybe other areas. I don't know if maybe you've lived this amazing life where none of these have happened, but for me, I could, I could relate to each and every one of those and realize that every time that happened, my heart, our heart, gets a little bit more hard. We do not want this to happen. We do not want to put ourselves out there. We do not want to go through one of those situations ever again. And so we as human beings, our, our defense mechanism is to kind of, I'm going to put up some guards so that doesn't happen. I'm not going to care as much. I'm not going to get my heart broken. I'm not going to put myself in a situation where someone laughs at me. How about art class? You guys remember that? You're sitting there, you're drawing the thing the teacher asks you to draw, and you're pretty proud of your little sketch in front of yourself. And then you look over at Jeremy Houck's page next to you, and you're like, that looks like a photograph. How did he make that happen? He's got the same pencil in his hand as I do, and his looks amazing. And you look back at yours, and it looks like garbage, right? And so what we do is we compare. We look at other people. We say, well, they're doing it better, or that person didn't get hurt, or he got picked for the game first, and blah, blah, blah. Suddenly our effort is now bad or not as good, even though it was pretty good when we first did it because we compared it to somebody else left or right of us. So we're going to go through all that and what the Bible has to say about it. Vulnerability is a, is a buzzword a little bit. I didn't really realize it was, but it's a word that uh, has been fairly talked about recently and, and really from an uh, author, Brene Brown, who I hadn't heard of before. A friend suggested the book, and then I mentioned it to my wife, and she goes, oh, yeah, I've read that book. And I was like, oh, well. I, I, missed the, I missed the memo that we were into vulnerability at the time. But I found out some pretty cool stuff reading this book and then saw the parallels to the Christian life. And that is what we're going to talk about today is, is, is reading this book, Power of Vulnerability, and then, and then connecting it with things in the Bible and realizing these are equal. And it's pretty interesting. It made the words of the Bible jump off the page. So I'm hoping that it does that to you today. So the definition, this is just the quick Google search definition, susceptible to physical or emotional attack or harm doesn't seem positive. In fact, if I just, if I had told you ahead of time I was going to speak on vulnerability and then said, anybody who needs to leave can leave, maybe no one would be here, right? It doesn't seem like a fun topic to get into, but there's a silver lining. So hang in there. It's going to be, it's going to be good. So Brene Brown study, started, she's a social worker, researcher, doctoral, something or other, that studied, set out to study shame, the emotions of shame, where it comes from, and all that stuff. So when we talked about those things earlier about worthiness, shame is part of that, right? We All of those things from your first broken heart to not getting picked for the team for being physically different or not liking yourself physically for whatever reason. Um, a lot of that has to do with the emotion of shame. So she started out with shame. Let's keep going. Shame and fear are tied together. So vulnerability is the fear of the, you look at the uh, definition, susceptible to physical or emotional attack or harm. So fear. Okay. So we're scared. We're scared that other people are going to find out. We're scared we're not going to measure up. We're fearful of all these things that are going to happen to us. And we're battling that all the time. Whether you admit it or not, you're battling that. What if, what if people find out? What if people, what if I know? Will they love me? Will they break up with me? Will they never talk to me again? There's fears that are happening constantly that are just below the surface, whether you're uh, identifying with those things or not. It's a self-focused emotion, right? Vulnerability is looking inward, not outward. Great, gratefulness is something where you're looking outward. You're saying, it is enough. I'm, I'm okay. I, I measure up. I'm okay. Vulnerability is probably the opposite of that, where it's a self-focused emotion. And we know from a lot of biblical lessons that the more you're focused on yourself, 
the trickier and harder the lesson is to learn. Low self-esteem. I love, um, uh, let's see. Oh, now I'm forgetting the guy's name, but um, Jay Leno. How could I forget his name? Okay, Jay Leno's in Newport. He lives in Newport, where I live, so we're neighbors, buddies. Uh, and so we, we went to see him. He, he does little uh, comedy bits at a local theater in Newport, tiny, half the size of this place. And um, <clears throat> he kind of works out new material. This guy's like, I don't know, 77, 78 years old. He's got, instead of like long stories that go on about things that, you know, he tells three or four stories, big laughs, he tells little zingers that, that just little quick jokes that last a few seconds. You know, hundreds and hundreds of these things in, a, in an hour. So you're thinking, how does this guy remember all these like cool little jokes? I can't remember one coming out of there. The one I remember was him talking about low self-esteem. And this was actually in an interview that I, uh, or a podcast or something, and I said, well, you know, what? How, do you, how do you keep this up, Jay? Why, why do you keep this up? And he's like, I've got low self-esteem. Like, what? He goes, that's my secret, is that I have low self-esteem, meaning I am always thinking, I am terrible. I'm never going to work. I, I got to work at it every day. This is a low self-esteem, this idea that you're not as good as anyone says it. And of course, everyone's like, oh, Jay, you're so great. You're so great. And he's like thinking, nope, I'm not. So even a guy like Jay Leno, who we all know and you know see, and he's just got this great personality, uh, he's saying, I think I'm an idiot. I'm a mess. So let's keep going. Um, so because we have these protection pieces that we've all built around our heart, for a word picture, uh, we start developing coping skills for that. And um, I think I already mentioned one, but that's that hard heart. The Bible talks about having a hard heart. And I think we can all understand what that is, but it's the idea that nothing's going to hurt me. I've got it. I don't need God. I don't need other people. I'm that sort of New England Yankee mentality that doesn't matter what happens. I'm going to make it. I don't care. I'm sustainable. I can do it. I don't need anybody else around me. That hard heart. The Bible warns about hard-heartedness. The whole book. Don't be hard-hearted. Don't, don't do this. Like, you being soft and open is going to be way better for you, except in our pridefulness, we go there with the hard heart. Lack of empathy. Suddenly, we're focused on ourselves. We don't care about the other guy. When we're when we're careful about protecting ourselves, we are less worried about anybody else because our focus is again on ourselves. Perfectionism. I'm going to make everything perfect. I'm going to do things perfectly. I'm going to make my life perfect. I'm going to make that situation over there perfect. This relationship's going to be perfect. Everything is going to be perfect, right? I hear people say all the time, well, I'm a perfectionist. Um, and I think, really? Like, I got nothing. I got nothing that's perfect. So, uh, I mean, if whatever the opposite of perfectionism is, is where where I'm living. Um, pride, right? This this sin of saying that I'm in charge, God is not in charge, and I'm going to make it right. And, and the the buck stops here. The buck does not stop with God. And that pride, which is a tricky one for me, I feel like I'm always in that world. of battling with those issues. Addiction is covering up, like you're doing external things to cover up pain and hurt that is from these upper upper things which vulnerability opens up and so on. So let's, let's get into the redemptive story. So we have a problem. We can't do it on our own. Does this sound familiar? You probably know where I'm going with this, but the baseline of Christianity, the sort of the heartbeat of Christianity, answers this problem. Let's go with this verse. So this, this wasn't necessarily that exact verse. I want to be totally open and honest. But I, I wanted to say, I, I felt like when we're talking about vulnerability, we're leading up to, that's the problem, where's the answer? Every one of you was maybe nodding or at least identifying with some of the things we said about vulnerability. But then, okay, Spence, we get it. We know everything's 
terrible and a bunch of bad stuff happened and now I've got a hard heart. What do I do about it? So I just wrote down what, what the sort of heartbeat of Christianity was that answers this question. And then I looked for a verse that was kind of like it, and that's what this verse came from. So this is kind of what I just wrote down sort of off the cuff of what I felt like Christianity was, and then found a verse that was really similar. So this is sort of a paraphrase. Because we have, have all fallen short, so we're identifying with the problem instead of saying, there is no problem. I have a hard heart. Those, those things don't bother me anymore. I got my heart broken once in eighth grade, and I'm never opening up again to anybody. Because we have all fallen short, we are not worthy of God's love and eternal life. We're agreeing. The, the message of the Bible is that, yeah, we're, we're in. We, yeah, that is the problem. You don't measure up. You aren't good enough. You will never be good enough. The solution for that is that Christ died for us as a sacrifice that paid for our sin. What he did, not what we're going to do, not how we're going to protect ourselves. What he did, we're saying the spotlight is not on us. The spotlight is on what God did for us. The beauty of that is means it's, it takes the pressure completely off you, completely off me. It is, the pressure is not on you to make things perfect. The pressure is not on you to be loved by everyone. Pressure is not on you to be that perfect athlete that gets picked right away and wins the state championship every time they try it. The pressure is off because it's not about you. That Christ paid for our sin. He paid the ransom so that we could be free and have eternal relationship with him. What a great message. And we say that, we know that, we, we talk about it, but when you apply it to the issue of vulner being vulnerable, Suddenly, it's like, oh, wow, this is, this is not bad. This takes the pressure off. I don't have to sit there and wallow and protect and pretend that I'm not. This is setting us up for the next verse. So I read this verse, and again, we're talking about vulnerability. And it's not that vulnerability is the enemy. It's that vulnerability is the connection and the ticket out. It's the secret weapon that we all have that we're all trying to do the opposite with. One of the cool things about Christianity is that when you think you've got it figured out and I'm going to be tough and I'm going to be tough and I'm not going to let them know and I'm going to... Uh, and then you read the Bible and it says you're doing it the opposite way, buddy. You are totally going the wrong direction. That's when I know it's something of God and not of men because men wouldn't say that. Men would say, yep, toughen up. Suck it up. This is how you deal with that. The Bible says the opposite. And that's one of the cool ways that I know my faith is real because I'm getting answers that are opposite than the way I want to go. And when I apply them, it opens up life that I could have never dreamed about. 2 Corinthians 12. This one, this series of verses really hits the hammer, hits the nail on the, on the head with a hammer. Okay, so... Paul is talking about some revelations that he got about what heaven is, and he's answering questions to this Corinthian church about what's going on. And then he sort of stops and is like, wait, before I get too high and mighty about how God showed me this and God showed me this and you should know this, he kind of stops himself in the middle of a verse, and that's where we pick it up here. I will boast about a man like that. He's talking about this person he's describing about heaven and experiences that he's had. But I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. He's boasting about his weaknesses, something none of us do, right? None of us. I don't know about you, but you don't lead with your worst weakness when you meet somebody. Hi, I'm Spencer McComb, and I get most of my feelings out of what people think of me. I'm a people pleaser. That's not the first thing I say. I tell them all about all these great things, right? That's what I do first because I don't want people to know about the scary inside of me that's not great. Here's Paul saying, no, 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 it's not about me. I'm going to boast about the stuff that I'm terrible at. We're going we're to see another one where Paul lets his guard down in another book and talks about stuff that we can all identify with. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. We've all said that. Well, it's not boasting, it's true, 
Right? That's what he's saying. Of course I could tell him about that. It's true. He's got self awareness, right? That's one of the things we're going to talk about later is that you have self-awareness. You know you're seeing, you're seeing life, you're seeing this relationship, you're seeing your actions through the lens of God, not you. Because we all want to boast, right? We all want to tell people about the new car, or the new house, or the new girlfriend, or whatever it is that we just got. We want, to tell, we want to talk about ourselves. It's really great, great, great. So he's saying, even though it's true, I choose not to speak about it. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. These are great lines to realize what you should be doing with the knowledge that you have. And this, this last part of this part is a lot more about self-awareness. So understanding and praying to God, Lord, give me self-awareness. There's a lot of words flying out of my mouth every day. Help me understand what's hurting and what isn't. What's building myself up? So, uh, I, what does he say? I would uh, not be a fool because, and so no one would think more of me than is warranted. He's even worried about, like, overdoing it with the things that he knows. Let's go to the next slide. So this is continuing on in that same verse uh, at seven now. Or because of these surpassingly great revelations. So this is what he was talking about. He's referring back to that. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, so he even realizes why he's struggling, why he's got these things that aren't great about him that he knows, and he knows are bubbling right there. I was given a thorn in my flesh. Remember the asterisk? I added the asterisk. We're going to talk about another verse that talks about that. A messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, a verse that you've probably heard before. Maybe you didn't see it in this context. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So, he's laying it on the table. He doesn't tell you what the thorn is. He doesn't say what it is. We can all guess what it is. Maybe one of the reasons he doesn't say specifically is so that we could all identify with this situation, right? If he said, oh, I have problem sleeping or um, uh, you know stomach issues or I have these depressive thoughts, then we'd say, well, that's what he had. I don't have that, so this doesn't apply to me. I think the reason that he doesn't say exactly what it is is so that we could all say, I know what he's talking about. I've got a thorn. I've got an issue. I've got something that's bubbling beneath the surface that is not of God or warranted by God, and I don't want to have it anymore and Paul figures out a way to turn that around and say, it's just helping me be who I am so I don't get conceited, so I don't think I'm better than anybody else because I got issues just like the rest of us. I'm a mess like all the rest of you is what he's saying. I, I was going to say, let's have a raise of hand to anyone who's a mess, but we'll, we'll skip that. Let's say, keep your hand down if you're a mess. Yeah, see, everybody. Okay. Okay. Um, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Isn't that great? Isn't that how God works? If you look back on your life, God came through when you were at your worst, when you had no hope. He's always asking us, get to the end of yourself already. Don't try to prop yourself up. Don't try to pretend. Don't try to be something you're not. Every, almost every story in the Bible is about someone thinking they're great, getting knocked down, Falling to God and God raising up higher than it began. Almost every, almost every of the Bible verses, Old and New Testament, that's, the, that's what they're talking about. That's the main heartbeat of every story in the Bible is that person A thinks they're great. They fall. God scoops them up. And they do it on God's power and not their own power. Almost every, almost every story. And isn't that the story of our own lives? You could probably think back to your own life and say, yep. That's happened to me. I was at the end of it, and that's when God showed up. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Boasting in weakness. So he follows it up and sort of closes this series of verses with uh, that the Christ's power may rest on me. And so he realizes... And he's telling us, and we're reading these verses over and over, 2,000 years later, trying to figure out how to do this. And he's basically saying it. So in walks 
Brene Brown. I think we can go to the next slide. Um, is this the next one? Oh, a little bit more verses. Sorry, we'll keep going. Uh, okay, so we're going to continue <laughs> on, on verse 12. That is why, for Christ's sakes, I delight in weaknesses. He, he doubles down on this, right? He doesn't want to make, he wants to make sure the Corinthians and us don't miss this, right? He's like, says it like three different ways. So if you didn't catch it the first time, here we go. That is why, for Christ's sakes, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships and persecutions, difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Isn't that sound, isn't that, that verse sound like those things that we just talk, talked about at the beginning, about when you're worthy and all those things that happened when you were a kid and even happened today where you just feel like I didn't measure up, I didn't do it, I wasn't the cool kid in the class, etc. So I, wanna, I, I mentioned that we were talking about Paul. He has one other verse that I think we can all identify with and when I, when I read the thorn in the flesh thing, I want to figure it out. I'm like, what was he thinking about? What was that thorn? What was that thorn? And what, what kind of popped into my head was this verse in Romans where I think we can all identify with this. In fact, if you haven't said this at one point in your life, you're probably not a human and you should get checked to make sure that you're not an alien species or some sort of robot. Tell me if you can't identify with this one. Here's Paul in the middle of Romans, trying to get these Romans to behave. And he says, look, I don't understand what I do. For what I, for, well, this is hard to read, so hold on. For what I want to do, I do not do. We've all said that. But what I hate, I do. We all said that. We all looked back on our day and said, I started out this day not wanting to do that, and here I am at the end of the day, and I did exactly that. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good, meaning that there's some standard, some law, some sin that I, was, that I broke. As it is, it is no longer. I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Basically saying, I can feel that the things that I'm doing are not, not of God, but they're sort of my sinful desires. I'm doing things, and it's almost like I, I can't help myself. This is Paul, the guy who wrote most of the New Testament, is just laying it out here. He's wide open. He's being very vulnerable. Uh, but is sin living in me? For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is it. Um, that is in my sinful nature. So he realizes that his sin nature is a sin nature. He's not saying, I'm just a perfect guy and I got tricked this one time. He's saying, no, 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 no. I, almost everything in, coming out of me is a mess. And it is only for I have the desire to do what is good but I cannot carry it out. So here's Paul, and whether this was his thorn or not, or it was something around this topic, is giving us, he's identifying with all, every single person in this room. I, I, I set out to do things for God. I set out to do the right thing. I set out to have the right conversation. I set out to have this great conversation with this person, and then I blow it. Because I get worked up, I, I miss it, I don't say the right thing, I fall into pride, I fall into protecting myself, and then I mess up. So I think we can all identify with Paul in this situation. All right, next slide. So the power of vulnerability, which sounds like an oxymoron, right? How can vulnerability, how can, how can this bad stuff that we're trying to protect be a power center? So I'll lead you through what I learned from this, uh, it's actually a talk but um, it's in a book form and you can listen to it, called The Power of Vulnerability by Brene Brown. So she spent 10 years researching shame, which then led her to understanding that vulnerability is a virtue. So started out just trying to figure out why people have shame, what it is, sort of like really dialing down and interviewing and interviewing and interviewing people all over the spectrum to try to figure out what shame was all about. And it led her to the fact that people who had shame and then dealt with it with vulnerability 
which led to something she termed wholehearted people who are ex authentically experiencing joy. So if you follow this thought pattern here, 10 years of research on shame led to vulnerability being a positive thing, not a negative thing, which she didn't expect. And then realizing that wholehearted people practice vulnerability and that they're the ones who are authentically experiencing joy. Anybody want to live in that camp? I want to authentically experience joy. You may put another name on it, and you may say you're going to get there a certain way, but I think that's the baseline of what we're all hoping for, right? Authentically experiencing joy. As I read this over and over again, and this was my synopsis of her research, I thought, that reminds me of a Bible verse. Which one is it? So I look all over the place, look all over the place. So that, the way, shame, vulnerability, authentic experiencing joy. That's interesting. I kept reading it, reading it. Look at this verse in James 1. Tell me if these two don't seem similar to you. James 1. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and then perseverance finishes its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking in anything. So it's, it's actually the words and the, the list is backwards, but he, basically it says it's basically saying the same thing. That tough times produce perseverance, and perseverance produces joy. Let's go to the next verse that's very similar to this as well. Romans 5 we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, character hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So here's this TED Talk phenomenon, Brene Brown, uncovering this amazing truth about vulnerability, which has been in the Bible for 2,000 years. That gets me excited because it seems like, oh, this is record, this is groundbreaking information that we're getting and vulnerability and we're all going to be vulnerable. Wait a minute. Paul's been telling us that for 2,000 years, but we just kind of gloss over it in our Bible because it's just another verse and blah, 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 blah. This is where the stuff just jumps off the page. Brene Brown's research uncovered our vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, change, and connection to others. So being vulnerable, not covering up vulnerability, actually is where all this stuff started. And if she's not just saying it, she didn't want this to be true. If you listen to the talk, she's annoyed at the whole thing. Because she thought, I'm, she was a very type A, I gotta keep things in a rock and I'm hard hearted and blah, blah, blah. And she finds this stuff and it's changed her life completely. She started doing everything opposite of what she was doing as far as covering up and you know protecting and all that stuff. It just radically changed her life. And yet it's what God has been telling us from the beginning of creation, that we are not the center and that the vulnerability that we have, that we're so nervous about people finding out, is actually the connection we're going to have for others. So let's talk about some ways that this gets applied to our lives. So I, I sort of took her wholehearted, which I like that word, her words, and then connected it with the Christian life. So... This is a mix of biblical principles. All of them have biblical principles. And I can show you the verses if you're interested. And then some of her top items that apply this thing to, to um, your life. So vulnerability is an asset. We talked about that. But you may be thinking, well, why? Like, why would I just bring out my vulnerability, my my weaknesses, why would I boast about those? I know Paul said to do it, but I don't get it. I don't get it. Well, we're going to talk about those areas and why that, why that being soft, why that being um, able to let your hair down, why being able to share where, where you aren't great makes you way more relatable. Anybody have that person in their life that's got it all together and there's just no chinks in the armor? It's annoying to be around them. Just say that. It's annoying. Like they, got, they got nothing. But yet your friend is like, oh, man, I'm a mess. This is a, I, got, I, got, I got nothing. I got no answers for this one. 
somehow it's way easier to talk to that person because they you can relate to them because we're all dealing with it. Even big, big St. Paul was having struggles all over the place at the same base level that we are. So it sort of doesn't matter. We're all struggling. We're all in it. We're all struggling. The Bible doesn't say you're not going to struggle. It doesn't say that if you say this word, you're all, all your problems are going to go away. No, the opposite. He says, your problems are going to be where I show up. So your problems are the things where you're like, God, this is, I'm a mess with your friends. I'm a mess. Does it mean that we're just looking for attention and want to drone on and on about all our problems to everybody? Of course not. But we all know what it means because we're all protecting ourselves so much all the time that we don't even realize it. So vulnerability is an asset. Identifying with Christ. When I first heard that, identifying Christ, I'm like, that's not right. Christ, he was so perfect. He didn't sin. He just came down here and everything was great. And All right, he's God. He's omnipotent. He could do anything, anywhere he wants. And he humbles himself to be a baby and then walks around crying, hurting, feeling sadness, just like living amongst us for 33 years, getting, getting spit on, beat up, and then ultimately killed. I would say that's pretty vulnerable. Would you agree? It's not that he had a, a perfect run. He had some cool stuff that happened to him here. But at the end, he was thrown, thrown out, put on a cross like a common thief. So are we identifying with Christ? Are we identifying with Paul? who wrote those verses, and it's building us for deep connection with others. We all know that to be true, but we're all so deathly afraid to share our vulnerability with others and to be open about that and be wholehearted, meaning open-hearted, not hard-hearted, the opposite of that. So let's go on to some of these other tidbits that we can use to be more wholehearted. Resilience. So as Brene went around and interviewed all these people, she realizes that the people who were not struggling in these areas had these characteristics, and this is one of them, that they, had, they, were, they were of strong faith. Now, she clarifies that didn't mean they were all rock-solid Christian believers, but they all had faith. They all had something that was outside of themselves. She said a lot of them were Christians. She is a Christian, but... Um, Brene Brown's a Christian, but uh, she does talk about how it wasn't just just one one brand of Christianity or whatever, um, but that they all had a faith walk, and they all prioritized rest, sleep, not the same thing, and play. And uh, this really annoyed Brene in the in her talk because she just thought play was for kids, and why do we need to do that? And that's just a waste of time. I could be way more productive if I don't go da 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 You guys all know the answer. And play doesn't necessarily mean just sports or something. It could be whatever you're into that you just love doing and you just lose yourself in and you lose track of time and you could just do it forever and it's just great. That's play, right? And it re re gives you resilience, gives you the ability to be vulnerable because you, you're doing something you don't really care about. You just love doing it. You may not love what the score is at the end of the game or if the pot looks perfect. You just enjoy the craft of doing it in a way that you can just lose yourself in it. Uh, let's keep going. Gratitude trumps foreboding, foreboding joy. I didn't know what foreboding joy was at first. But I think once I explain it, you'll all identify with what it is. Foreboding joy. Imagine you're sitting down to watch a movie. There's Christmas music playing. The family's driving. Mom and dad are in the front. The three cheery kids are in the back, and they're singing Christmas carols, and they're racing down the road, and mom and dad join in, and they're all singing, and they're all driving, and there's this pleasant music playing. What happens next? Something goes wrong, right? <laughs> There's a big explosion, there's a trap, there's a crash, there's a, something just gets wrecked, right? And then we, we, we connected with this family and, oh, aren't they cute and it's so beautiful, Christmas, is kind of, and then, right? The pothole, the wheel falls off, the car flips over. How much of, how many of us 
in a moment of joy, in the back of our mind are thinking, what's going to happen next? What happens after this joy? Because something's going to go down, right? The other shoe will drop, which I learned was living in a tenement house, not me, but just the idea of it, you'd hear the kid ahead of, above you take off his one shoe and drop it on the ground, and then you'd hear the other shoe drop, right? Which means there's good things are going to happen, but that other bad thing's coming is going to even everything out, and I'm going to steal my joy away. Anybody identify with foreboding joy? Probably didn't know what the word was. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right. But uh, I think we've all been there, right? You, you, you sort of don't let yourself. That's because you have a hard heart, right? You can't experience full joy if you're always thinking, well, something bad's going to happen. I got to protect myself. I can't be fully enjoying this situation because what if we come home from date night and there's an axe murderer running around our house killing our kids? So I can't be that grateful or in the moment because there could be a problem later. We've all been there. So gratitude is something that says I'm in the moment, it is enough, and I don't need to worry about what could happen because it probably won't. Life is uncertain, the future, the future is fiction, and Christ is unwavering. All right, maybe looking by the, uh, the hairstyles in the audience, everyone knows who this is if you're a gen... Gen Y or less, you may not know who this is, but the Jetsons, remember those guys? At this point in our lives, we were going to be flying around in cars, right? That's what we, that's what we thought. That's what was, actually, that was like, of course we're going to be flying around in cars. And of course, we're going to have robots that do everything for us. Well, maybe that's sort of didn't happen. Uh, but we all think what we're worried about is going to happen, right? We're sure of it. When you're laying in bed at night thinking about what's going to happen or a mean comment, what you're going to say and how you're going to handle this. and blah, 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 blah. We all think this is what's going to happen and this is what I'm going to say and this is what's going to happen. I'm going to tell that person. Blah, 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 blah. It never happens. It never happens the way we think it's going to happen. It's, all, it's fake. It's what we've got in our head is what's going to happen is fake. Life is uncertain. It's going to change. Whether we think it's going to be great tomorrow or terrible tomorrow, we're wrong. It's not going to be. It's not going to be what we think it is, just like we're not flying around in cars, right? We thought we were. In fact, I'm kind of disappointed we're not. But we're not yet. Maybe electric vehicles, but they don't fly yet, so we'll get there. The future is fake. It's no sense in worrying about it. It's not going to happen. We need to be closer to God than closer to worrying about the future. Be creative and silly a childlike inhibition. So, we're all so nervous about looking cool for the cool kids, right? We started that in elementary school, continued double down in middle school, high school, you were in your full glory of being cool with the cool kids. College, it was still there, and it's still in us. We sort of built it into our DNA. I got to be cool. I got to be the man. I can't be silly. I can't have people laugh at me. But think about the people that you really relate to and are fun and happy and you want to spend time with. They're bananas, nuts, right? They're crazy and goofy and screw around and say things they're not supposed to and burp on accident and the whole thing. And yet we love them, right? We want to be around that person, the person who's perfect and doesn't say anything and has the full manners and the whole thing. Uh, yeah, they're fun to sort of fun to be around, but the silly and letting yourself, Christ says childlike faith, right? That's what he says. Like, just be like children. You're fine. You're being, you're, you're so worried about yourself. You're so trying to be so serious. Just be like children. Just relax and be creative. Just like that, when we were talking about art class earlier and you're working on your page or working on your sculpture and then you looked over at Johnny's and you were like, oh my gosh, I, I am not into this, right? But there's an aspect of not looking to the other person to see just enjoying the craft of it and being, I love when my kids, when we write a thank you note, which my kids hate, which every kid hates, um, to someone, someone did something cool for us, right? Invited us somewhere, whatever. We write a thank you note. 
And they can you know, write out the thank you and blah, blah, blah. But what's the best part of getting a note from a kid? It's the goofy picture that they write on it, right? So I'm like, you got to do a goofy picture. And I'm like, I don't want to do a goofy picture. I'm like, just draw anything. It doesn't matter. The worse it is, the better. Isn't that great? You get a card from a kid, and he draws a horse, and it's got four heads and polka dots, and you're like, it's awesome. But suddenly, when we're old, older, and we know better, suddenly it's not cool anymore, and you look like an axe murderer. That's not really true. We think that, but it's not really true. Being goofy and wild and different and drawing a horse with three heads and polka dots is still fun. It's still OK. Let, let go. You don't need to do this. Intentional daily time with God will crush anxiety. So we talked about that future. Say, so, well, how do I how do I do that? How do I how do I become vulnerable when I've got so I'm so worried? I'm white knuckle in every conversation, every drive, every flight, every interaction. I'm, I'm just so wound up. I have found that a morning ritual where you say, and we've talked about this before a little bit, and I heard quiet time, quiet time, quiet time my whole life growing up in the church. And I was like, whatever, that's for other people. And now that I've been doing it for three or four years now, God finally knocked me over the head and be like, just suck it up and do it. Now I'm like, I can never, I don't know how I was functioning without that. It just changes the game completely. You are leaving your house like a football player running into the infield where they have those big, um, that big circle with the cray paper on it and it says, go get them bowls. And the first person through there busts through it. And now the crowd goes bananas and the people run out on the field. You can imagine how those guys feel, right? They're ready to just tear people's heads off. They're so fired up. They got this huge arena screaming at them. They just busted through the, the sign. That's what I feel like every morning. I'm not kidding. Like, it doesn't matter what happens. God and I are on this. We already won the day, and we are running out of that tunnel when the crowd goes bananas. And I, I just want to share that with you guys. Like, I want everyone to have that. I want you all to have that. I don't want you to fumble out of your house after fighting with the alarm clock, doing your thing on the makeup on the way to the office, and then you sit down. And you're like, oh. No one wants that. You don't want that. Stop it. Spend time with God in the morning. Let's keep going. We are all a mess. We need a savior. Don't take yourself too seriously and enjoy the ride. I don't know if you can see this very well. It's a little more blur than I thought, but we got the guys in the back with their hands up, right? Then we got mom and kids. The middle folks are like barely holding it together, but the, the front row is just, you know, they're out of their minds, right? We can all identify probably with all those people at one point or another, but it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be great. It's not going to, it's always going to be a mess. That's how God wants it. What a change in paradigm to realize that God wants the mess. He's glorified in the mess. He's not glorified when we got it all together. When we think we're in God's will and everything's going great, God's actually waiting for us to skin our knee again so that he can come to our rescue. Realize that that's the power of the Bible. That's the power of a personal relationship with Christ. And so I want... I would hope that you guys could see the connection about opening yourself up, using vulnerability as a superpower instead of something to hide and hold and keep back and make sure no one ever finds out about it. Amazing time. I want to share one last thing, which is completely unrelated, but it's an example of vulnerability on the main stage. <clears throat> My wife, Michelle, since I've met her, has wanted to be either in the military or a police officer or something in that realm. And she's a social worker, but like Brene Brown. And as we're driving around, we see police officers and army guys and stuff. And, and you know, I, I know there's always been a, an interest, a fantasy, a an ability to do that. And 
as a 47-year-old mother of two, it sort of felt like that day had passed, right? Not going to be a police officer, not going to be in the, in the Army. They don't take people who are that age. And she had an opportunity to join, to change jobs and be working at the Naval Academy Prep School, which um, gets 17, 18, 19-year-old kids ready to go to the to the Naval Academy in Annapolis, but the school is in Newport. So she talks through with kids that are in that age and helps them sort out life so that they can continue on and get ready to go to the academy in, in Annapolis. <clears throat> so she gets to rub shoulders with a lot of military folks. And uh, if anything, I thought, well, that'll be great. She kind of pretends to be in the military, and that'll kind of get that out of her system. That's probably the best thing we could do. Uh, what a great opportunity. It wasn't enough. And I am just so amazed at my wife that she had the um, fortitude and uh, vulnerability to continue pressing to see, is there any way that I could still join? And uh, Friday afternoon, we can pull it up here, Michelle McComb joined the uh, Rhode Island National Guard. <laughs> and fulfilled, or is about to begin to fill, a lifelong dream of serving her country. Um, and uh, so you can... Uh, Give her a congratulations and uh, just know that our family is really proud of her and looking forward to this next chapter of our life. All right, let's pray because I'm almost a little earlier than Pastor usually finishes. So, Lord, we uh, thank you so much for just changing the game for us. We are, uh, we're a mess and we're, we're in a fallen world. We're meant to be a mess. We need you on every turn. We just pray that we open our hearts. Instead of closing them, closing them to others, closing them to ridicule, Lord, that we just open it up. And is it going to be bumpy and hurtful at times? But, Lord, the joy is so much better. We thank you for just turning the tables on us, teaching us things that we didn't know that we were going the opposite direction on. We pray that your word penetrates our heart and changes us. In Jesus' name, amen.